Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Dan Klein, President and CEO of the Patient Access Network Foundation. Dan has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dan, for joining us today. Well, I'm happy to be here. So let's talk about affordability of healthcare mm -hmm. and how PAN functions within this marketplace. Sure. I think PAN is probably the largest uh, foundation that nobody's ever heard of because we play a unique role within the um, reimbursement system. Um, for people particularly um, with serious illnesses, um, high out-of-pocket costs have become a very significant impediment to getting treatment. So patients who may have cancer or chronic diseases like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis Oftentimes, they're taking specialty medications. And in recent years, those medications have started to be um, covered in ways that leave a lot of cost for the patient to pick up in the form of deductibles and coinsurance. So uh, when we talk about affordability, we have to realize that patients today may have to pay 10, 20, 30% or more of their income just to cover the out-of-pocket costs for their uh, medications. And the burden falls disproportionately on people with serious illness. What PAN does is fill that gap. So basically, we're a uh, stopgap measure, if you will, a safety net for people who need help with those out-of-pocket costs. So um, someone on Medicare who is most likely living on Social Security may have a little bit of additional income. Um, could easily end up paying 20% or more of their income without um, the help that we provide. So we're able to pick up their deductibles and their coinsurance, and they're able to then uh, get the treatment that they need and focus on recovering their health and uh, you know, improving their quality of life. And you ameliorate this, this completely unacceptable series of options. You either don't get treated mm -hmm. or you get treated and descend into poverty. Or you start treatment and can't stay on treatment. And then you stop treatment and then and then you right. you uh, you bounce back between health and and then dire need and then right. recovery and then it's a vicious cycle if you can't stay on treatment. We provide assistance for about sixty different illnesses and people can come to us and request a grant, and we will provide enough funding for them to pay their deductibles and their coinsurance for a full year, typically. And um, the people that we're particularly um, focused on are those with uh, serious illnesses because the burden really does fall on them disproportionately. Most people who have Medicare coverage or other insurance coverage who are relatively healthy don't see the high out-of-pocket costs. They may see the high deductible, but unless they're using a specialty medication, unless they're on some kind of um, long-term maintenance uh, treatment, they may not realize that their insurance is not really adequate. So we're helping those people who are often called the underinsured. And we um, uh, provide as much funding as we can in these different disease areas. And we still um, you know, are not able to help everybody who comes to us. So for example, uh, last year we provided about 122,000 grants to patients. And we provided over $500 million in uh, funding just last year. And you've provided up to $2.6 billion in funding so right. far. Since our inception. Since your inception. So um, we've been around for 14 years, and in that time we've provided grants to nearly a million people and over two and a half billion dollars in, in assistance. So the scale of the problem is, is daunting, and we're not the only foundation that does this kind of work. There are another, you know, seven, eight, nine foundations that are uh, significant. Uh, um, parts of the safety net and do similar um, type of work to PAN. So, you know, collectively, um, we still are unable to meet all the need. 
And that's um, worrisome because the need is growing. I think what people don't realize is that uh, um, the number of Medicare patients is growing and the number of Medicare patients who are exposed to these high out-of-pocket costs is growing. Plus, in addition to the need growing and the costs growing, you have the fact that, that um, how the, the, the system functions mm -hmm. is, it, it seems to embed increasing inefficiencies that are being funded, that are draining some of the resource out of the, uh, out of the funders, the funders, whether they're individuals or insurance companies or organizations right. like yours. So that trajectory also has to shift. Yeah, I think that the uh, um, complexity in the U.S. healthcare system has added to cost. And we hear a lot of um, you know, discussion about um, what's driving up costs in the U.S. compared to um, costs in Europe or um, other countries that have good healthcare systems. And in the U.S., the cost is you know, double, really, what it is per capita um, compared to um, other Western uh, European type uh, what do you countries. Think the, what do you think the cause is, is for that? It seems to me that, that it can't come from the patients. Patients are just people, and people across the world have similar uh, issues. Mm -hmm. So it can't be a patient issue. It can't be that we have greater uh, level of disease here in this country. Um, the doctors are no better or, or, or worse than, than other educated, you know, well-informed well uh, physicians. Um, what is going on? What's different is the um, way healthcare is financed in the U.S. And we have um, a very complicated system with lots of, um, lots of middlemen and everybody is getting paid along the way. So that's one of the reasons you know, costs are higher in the US, is just the administrative complexity is greater. Is it, it's, it's the market inefficiencies. It's the, it's the actual friction that we've built into our system. That's one good way of describing it, yeah. And you don't have that in um, systems where there are fewer intermediaries in the um, reimbursement process. But isn't, so you have a, a, a background in information technology as well. Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't the free market about reducing friction? It's about uh, creating the ability to have uh, responsiveness. Um, why is the market not responding in ways that reduces this, uh, this friction? How, how come we're, we seem to have layer upon layer upon layer and all these intermediaries, as you point out, or all these administrative costs, um, it would seem that there should be some ability to disintermediate and to create a more direct relationship between the various players and, and then to eliminate those. Well, I, I think there are efforts in that direction, but uh, so far, you know, it hasn't uh, really paid off. I think that we'll see more experiments looking at ways to make the system more efficient. Um, but we're in a you know, different political system. There's reluctance to um, go in the direction of a single payer, uh, which would simplify the administrative complexity. And there is um, also a, a need in this industry to have regulation. So you're balancing um, the free market against regulation, and you also have a lot of concentration of um, of uh, um, control, so there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry. Um, so you don't really have a perfect market, and the idea that you know you have a frictionless uh, free market just isn't you know easy to achieve within the healthcare sector. Um, you know there's always going to be a need for regulation, and there's going to always be um, some friction that's required to keep patients safe and to make sure that um, um, the quality is high. Um, that said, obviously other countries you know, have found ways to um, reduce the um, administrative costs. Um, and another driver you know, certainly here is um, probably related to the um, um, you know, cost of uh, medications. There's been a lot certainly uh, in the news about that. And um, the U.S. is a little different than other countries in that it doesn't 
use health technology assessments or other uh, techniques to try to put uh, pressure downward on uh, the costs of very expensive drugs. And how am I likely to um, uh, come into contact with PAN if I am a person in need? So generally, um, you know, it's pretty easy to uh, come to PAN and get a, get a grant. It's about a 10 to 15 minute long process. So while you're actually talking to our call center or online with um, the uh, web application, we'll tell you immediately whether your grant's approved. So, um, and you can use that right away. You can take that to your pharmacy immediately and fill your prescription. So if you could uh, shape the healthcare system, and, but, but we're restricted in terms of, well, let's just reduce the costs, right? How would you, how would you reshape um, how you interacted with the, the system that provides health care but at a, at a cost that is too high, with right. too high deductibles, so that you were less necessary as an organization? I would like to be unnecessary as an organization. So PAN is an um, imperfect solution and foundations like PAN. We really shouldn't exist if the healthcare system was doing what it needs to be doing in the way of uh, providing affordable access to critical medications. There wouldn't be a need for us. So we would recommend three things in Medicare. One, we would recommend trying to find a way to spread the out-of-pocket costs more evenly throughout the year. So it's not hitting all in January or in February. Um, Two, we think there needs to be some kind of um, uh, out-of-pocket limit so that um, uh, patients aren't exposed to an unlimited uh, amount of cost. And you know, the, the third thing is to try to look at um, whether there are some ways to um, uh, you know, shift uh, um, um, money you know, so that patients who are seriously ill within Medicare aren't being disproportionately affected. The situation at hand is that PAN and similar foundations um, provide a critical safety net for patients who are seriously ill. And there is no alternative right now available to those patients. So um, while I look forward to uh, a time when the healthcare system is reformed and uh, addresses this problem more directly, um, we will do our best to, you know, um, be here to help those patients who, who need the help that we provide. Well, Dan Klein, thank you so much for describing the work of the Patient Access Network, uh, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you very much.